Among the numerous challenges facing President Sam Houston, those revolving around the Republic's army were the toughest. During the summer of 1836, hundreds of American volunteers flocked to Texas seeking adventure, glory, and plunder. So it was that the cast of the army transformed from settlers fighting for hearth and home to one three times as large, consisting primarily of American volunteers with few ties to the Republic they had sworn to defend. And the most fractious of these was Felix Huston. And what a piece of work he was. A native of Mississippi, he had arrived in Texas on July 4th. 1836. Almost immediately, he embroiled himself with local politics, aligning himself against ad interim President David G. Burnett. On December 20th, 1836, President Houston appointed him junior brigadier general and temporary commander of the army. Houston never intended to retain Huston a newcomer with scant military experience in command. Nevertheless, shortly thereafter, Huston started speaking of my army. From the instant he took temporary command, Huston demonstrated that his ambition leapt far beyond his ability. Impatient to realize his dreams of conquest, he proposed an invasion of Mexico that would culminate in the capture of Matamoros. The volunteers nicknamed their 36-year-old chief Old Leather Breeches, denoting his rough and rowdy manner. How could his men fail to love him? In his rebellion, insolence, and sedition, Huston was a mirror image of themselves. President Houston decided that General Huston had to go. On January 31st, 1837, West Point graduate Albert Sidney Johnston won appointment as senior brigadier general in command of the army. Yet, on February 4th, when Johnston arrived in camp to take lawful command of the army, Huston refused to stand down. No. Instead, citing his refusal to be overslawed under humiliating circumstances, he challenged his replacement to a duel. The two men exchanged six shots. Huston's last bullet tore through Johnston's hip, oh, my leg. rendering him unable to assume command. Besides, Huston was now more popular than ever. When he returned to camp following the duel, a thousand soldiers rushed forward to congratulate him. The raucous throng would never have abided his removal. Both General Huston and the mutable, rank-scented mob he led had spun wildly out of control. Neither appeared willing to follow the mandates of the duly elected civilian authorities. The president had no choice but to retain Huston. He may have been a querulous fool, but he was the only man the volunteers seemed willing to obey. There were also political considerations. The president required the support of the Army Party to preserve control of the government. Most of his opposition came from those with Army ties or who harbored military aspirations. Consequently, Houston had to bide his time and give General Huston just enough rope to hang himself. Following the duel, conditions deteriorated even further. 
President Houston received reports that bands of soldiers were ransacking supplies from citizens without offering even the promise of compensation. As he explained, My object is to have the Army supplied regularly and prevent all future impressments of supplies or anything else which may belong to the citizens. Such may have been the President's object, but at least in the short term, it was far beyond the capability of the government. One frustrated Texian officer complained in a letter to Houston, I am a doing everything in my power for to discipline my command, but it is very hard for to command men that is barefooted and naked and hungry. The volunteers not only failed to observe the regulation and routine of military organization, but openly mocked such notions. Many citizens came to believe that the Texian army was more of a threat to their peace, security, and civil liberties than the Mexican army was. The Wiley Houston advocated placing a portion of the army on what amounted to a permanent liberty. The president authorized Secretary of War, William S. Fisher, to grant leaves to as many of the troops as he deemed appropriate. When Fisher arrived in camp, he was assailed by crowds of applicants for furlough. The volunteers seemed to have had enough of hunger, inactivity, and the rigors of camp life. Even before Fisher's arrival, most of the troops were feeling footy. It was time to move on. Many of them were drifters anyway gamblers, thimble riggers, men on the make for the next big score. The majority who joined up anticipating a quick coup now realized that military life offered nothing of what they craved. The vision of wealth, fame, and glory had proven a mirage. It was manifest. They would not fulfill their destiny in the Texas Army. On May 24th, Fisher wrote Houston, asserting it would be good policy to furlough all military men and new recruits. This would leave in the field a force of 600 men. The president immediately approved Fisher's proposition and in one stroke reduced the army from some 3,600 to a manageable number. In time, those troops that remained served out their enlistments, received their furloughs, are deserted. Future Governor Francis Lubbock, a man involved in Texas politics for more than 60 years, later stated the furloughing of the Army of the Republic in 1837 was one of the most marked evidences of statecraft he had ever witnessed. And what of General Huston? With his army reduced to 600 men, he knew that he could not conduct a campaign against Matamoros and abandoned his dreams of conquest. Thus, the army of the Texas Republic became less of a burden and less of a threat to its citizens.